Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is John I am an alcoholic. Hi, John. And it's, by the grace of God, strong sponsorship and actions of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've managed to stay sober since December 19th, 1982. Woo! And uh, the topic, it sounds like it's fear. And I'm afraid that I drank a little too much iced tea before I got uh, I got up here tonight. <laughs> and uh, I'm about ready to free you down, but Bill says I'll warm up here quickly, so... I uh, I want to thank the I want to thank certain members of the committee for asking me to speak. I I feel like I had it in, and uh, uh, I, it's been I don't know it's been a, I, I was at this conference. Cindy and I was at this conference. I don't know, hundred a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, I our host and hostess this week has been absolutely phenomenal. I, I know you other speakers have probably had fairly decent hosts, but not like us. We we happen to have a host and hostess that give us a grandkid to play around with, so it's, <laughs> it's kind of been a great blast. Uh, it's been a good trip for us, and, and it's, uh, <clears throat> it's it's always uh, good to be here. It seems like this is kind of getting to be a home away from home. Uh, there's all kinds of folks here that, that we've met over the years, and got me pretty good friends with and it's good to see you folks um i uh my uh my mom died a few months ago and and uh, i seem to have a hard time giving a talk anymore it seems like i always got other things on my mind and about 30 days after my mom died a guy that i sponsored for 25 years of sobriety he died and on that same day my dad had a heart attack Dad's had a stroke since then, and now he's, uh, I got a call yesterday, and he's in the hospital again, so I'm, I'm headed to San Angelo, Texas. <laughs> it's one of those places that you really got to be going there to get there and, <laughs> and, uh, in the morning, so I'm going to miss tomorrow's talk. I, but uh, I don't know. You know, it's just the way things are. You know, you, I, I thought that when I come to Alcoholics and I don't know it's the way some of these old folks sounded, like everything was going to be hunky-dory for the rest of my life, and it just don't work like that. It seems like I've had a lot of times that I really needed to drink, it seems like, but I just never never got around to it because of you folks, and I'm really glad because it seems to me that every time I ended up getting drink, get, getting drunk, I ended up getting more trouble than what I started out to have. And it's because of people like you and rooms like this I've been able to stay sober. It's an amazing process for a guy like me because I, I like to drink. <laughs> I mean, I, I like to drink. I like to do drugs. I do everything and I, everything, anything to screw up my life. I just love it, you know. And, and uh, I've, uh, I, I've absolutely, uh, I've enjoyed my sobriety. I really have. It hasn't always been wonderful, but I, I got to tell you, it's always been pretty good. It really has. And, and uh, geez, I'd have missed the whole thing if it was left up to me, you know, because I have the secret weapon. I, I'm sure that there's one or two people in this room that have the secret weapon. You know, it's that gray matter between years. I'll tell you how good my secret weapon works. Um, I'm in the ranch and farming business and here oh, about a year or two before I got, it was about a year before I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, which would have almost been about 25 years ago. Uh, I uh, got a new banker and me and this friend of mine, we went out looking for hay one day and we were discussing this new banker that we both had got. We hadn't met him yet, you know, and <clears throat> I don't know if, if you've got a business like mine, it's really important that you take care of your banker. You, you've got to really, you kind of got to really treat them right. And, and uh, me and this guy are out looking for this hay this day, talking about this new banker. And I, the way we looked at, uh, the way we looked for hay is I'd buy a fifth and he'd buy a fifth and we'd just drive around looking at hay. I mean, you know, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't too deep. And uh, <laughs> that night we ended up at the, I, I drink at one or two places usually. I also drink at the keg bar or the Northern Hotel. The Northern Hotel was a really nice place. The keg bar was not so really nice. And, and uh, I uh, remember that night, we, me and this uh, friend of mine, uh, we ended up at the Northern. And, uh, we was having a few drinks, and lo and, 
hold, here comes this new banker. And uh, Jay says to me, there he is. That's the guy. And so we sent him a drink, you know. And uh, he didn't wave to us. He didn't say thank you. He didn't send us a drink back. Now, I got the secret weapon inside here that starts telling me what's going on. Obviously, I'm going to be foreclosed on in just a short period of time. And he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to get to know us. And uh, so we sent him another drink in about an hour and nothing, nothing. I mean, not even, a, not even a smile. So it's obviously I'm going to have to leave the state. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> about a third hour goes by and we sent him another drink. And this time he gets up and he comes over. The people he's with, they went home or something. And sat down next to me and my friend Jay. And almost immediately, he and I got into this argument about sheep, me and this banker. And um, I got to tell you, I, I don't know nothing about sheep. <laughs> 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 I've never been around them. I don't know how to work them. I don't know how to take care of them or nothing. But we got, you know, I, I have the secret weapon. And that means that once I have four, five, six, ten, fifteen, twenty drinks, all of a sudden I, I begin to know things that I never knew that I knew. <laughs> and, and I can, and I can tell you that this argument was really, in, it, it really got to be really deep. And this guy would tell me things and I would disagree with him and then he'd disagree with me and, my friend uh, says, you know, let's go have something to eat. Come on, guys. You know, this is this is not going well. Let's go. And I hate to eat. I mean, if I'm drinking, I hate to eat. You know, I used to always kind of, you know, you $5 bill wrecking a $100 drink, uh, you know, drunk. And you just didn't want to, you know, who wants to eat? Well, al like to eat, you know, but <laughs> I want to drink, you know. And, and so I, uh, but anyway, Jay talked me into getting in his car. And I, I don't know about you folks, but when I, when I have, quite a few drinks, I get really tired in this. I just laid down in this banker's lap and went to sleep. <laughs> I mean, that's how you impress the new banker. You know, so. <laughs> Lo and behold, a couple of months later, I ended up finally going to AA because of, uh, mostly because of her, but I had to go to AA because uh, my life was absolutely upside down and I hated every part of my life. And, and I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm sitting there in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous for four, or five, six months, seven months, eight months. About nine months is, guess who walks in the door? It's my banker. <laughs> I had to make amends to him. I says, you know, i got to tell you something. I, I don't know nothing about sheep. And he says, listen, buddy. He says, neither do I. <laughs> so so that's, that's how my secret weapon works. And, you know, I... I uh, I enjoy drinking. I like to drink. I like to do, I just like to drink. It just absolutely always helped me be better at whatever it was I thought I was doing. And, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I, Cindy and I, we've been, we, we've been together forever, it seems like. And, and, uh, I can remember after I was sober for a few months, uh, uh, we went to eat at a restaurant one time and this guy was over there kind of talking in tongues. You know how we'll do if he's, you know, he's by himself and he's, I do that. And I said to Cindy, I said, thank God I never got that bag of this. She got that. She got one of those al -Anon looks at, you know, just all of a sudden it's like, what are you talking about? That's the way you always were. <laughs> so <clears throat> I have no concept. What's, I don't know how I can live with me as long as I live with me and not know a dang thing about me. You know, but that's, and that's kind of how I came to you. You know, I, I always want to remember how it was the last day I drank. Uh, I woke up in the basement of a friend's house. I didn't know that at the time. Uh, I didn't know what house I was in. I don't know if you guys have had this experience. It's like when you wake up, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, it's, you always, I always hate waking up like that because you always get asked people about what you did. And I hate, I hate people who know more about me and what I've been doing than what I know about it, you know, and it's, it always causes a little friction in my life anyway. And, and anyway, that, that morning I stumbled upstairs and this, this friend of mine, uh, uh, and I had been on a drink. I'm the kind of guy who kind of, you know, it's Thanksgiving or so, and I go after bread, and next thing you know, it's like Christmas. I mean, that's how I operate. And I woke up, and this is the 20, this is the 18th of December. You know, it's getting pretty close to Christmas. Uh, Thanksgiving's been over for a while. Uh, but I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I have these black periods in my life, and I thought that's the way you're supposed to drink. You know, I... I seem like I always blacked out. If I, if you're blacking out, you're kind of doing it right, it seemed like. And, 
And I can remember waking up in this basement and just absolutely not having a clue about what was going on in my life. I couldn't even find my pickup. I don't know where it was. And, and uh, we got upstairs, and so we started looking for this pickup of mine. And uh, somebody's like, it's like they'd steal it or something. It's like it ended up in places I'd never go, you know. But <laughs> we found it. and uh, He'd been drinking a lot. I'd been drinking a lot. And there's a friend of mine. His name is Frank. And Frank had... <clears throat> I was running the feedlot at the time, and this Frank would uh, come out and visit with me every once in a while. And one day, Frank came out. And I was always glad to see Frank. Frank was kind of like Bill and Ebby, you know. And uh, like Bill said, he was really glad that Ebby was coming because now I can have a few drinks. Well, Frank was like that. Frank come out, and I was going to have a few drinks with Frank, and the next thing you know, Frank wouldn't drink with me, and I couldn't figure it out. I said, Frank... <laughs> What's going on? Well, he says, I got to go to a meeting later on this afternoon. He says, I don't want to drink. He says, the fact is, I'm not drinking today. Now, that's something really wrong with Frank when he's not drinking, because Frank and I drink a lot together, and, and he just wouldn't do it. And I'm a really um, kind of an obnoxious drunk. If you don't want to drink with me and have fun, I'll have fun with you while I'm drinking. And I can remember I was down in the basement where our bar was, and Frank would uh, try to leave, and I'd just kind of grab him by the hind leg and drag him back down the stairs and put him in the chair. And we'd have a few more drinks, and I kept asking him, what was so important? What kind of meeting would be in so important that you couldn't have a few drinks with your old buddy John? And finally, he tells me he's going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, God dang, Frank, I think you're overreacting a little bit, don't you think? And I said, shoot, Frank, you drink just like I do. And Frank says, yeah, I, I know. And, and, <laughs> and I, uh, I, I, you know, Cindy and I at the time was kind of getting this divorce. Cindy was the black back belt, Alan, and I didn't realize that uh, this is the kind of people I had to, this is the kind of person I was married to. Uh, I was, you know, like I said, one of the favorite places that I drank was at the keg bar, and, and that's, you know, keg bar was kind of where the truck drivers and the bicycle, uh, the motorcycle guys, and uh, kind of like all these has-beens and wannabes and near-do-wells, they all met there and drank, and I felt right at home. And, and, uh, them guys, it's, it was kind of a depression period in, in Billings at the time, and, and Cindy told me one morning that she was going to go find a job, and I had to laugh because I'd been down there at the keg bar with all my friends. Some of them people hadn't had a job in over a year, year and a half. They'd been looking all over the place, couldn't find a job. I didn't know that I was married to an Alan. She went into town that day, got three jobs, and worked all three of them. And she was working that day that Frank showed up, and... Uh, I was telling Frank about Cindy and I, we wasn't getting along. She hated me and I hated her, and, and uh, I was trying to get a divorce. And Frank is having the kind of same kind of marital problems that I was having. And, uh, you know, I couldn't figure out why in the heck he was going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he says, well, he says, my life is really bad. And he says, I needed some help. And he says, I think it's helped me a little bit. I said, well, Frank, my life is really not going really well either. And uh, maybe you'd take me to a meeting. He says, no way. <laughs> he says, I ain't going to take you to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, well, why not, Frank? And he says, well, it's really simple. AA is for people who want to quit drinking, and obviously you still want to drink. And I don't know how he knew that, but anyway, uh, I can remember waking up that next morning going, my God, I almost overcorrected. I almost went to AA last night. And, you know, I, I was so relieved. You know, I had to die one day at a time for the next six months, and, and uh so Johnny and I, this guy that I woke up in his house that night uh, that on the 19th, uh, on the morning of the 19th, uh, I told Johnny, I said, you know, there's one guy I know who's in AA. His name is Frank. Let's go see him. And Johnny says, all right. He says, let's go see him. So we drove down to the feed store where Frank worked, and I walked in there, and I told Frank that me and Johnny were thinking about quitting drinking. And Frank was happy to see us. He was really happy to see us. It was only about... 8 o'clock in the morning. Johnny and I had already gone to the store and got us some beer because I always get real nervous when I drink a lot. And and uh, so Johnny and I was having a few beers. And Frank came out with these 20 questions. I don't know if you, you guys have seen the 20 questions. You know, nobody can pass the test, 20 questions. And, and I, I, I can remember he had these 20 questions. He's given it to me and Johnny. And shoot, we're both flunking. I'm cheating. And I'm still flunking. I think, <laughs> you know, it says if you answer one right, you could be two. You probably are and three. You just, you're cooked. You know, and and I figured that I had the secret weapon. I figured, well, here's the deal. Alcoholics Anonymous, <laughs> the name is not going to help. You know, people are not going to be flocking to a place called Alcoholics Anonymous. So what these guys have done is they come up with this test, 20 questions that no alcoholic or nobody who even drank a little bit could pass. Now, I gave that test to Cindy's Ellie 99s at home every once in a while just for the fun of it. 
they can't pass it. They can't drink right, and they can't pass the test either. Just like we, you know. And so I ended up uh, taking this test and flunking it. And so I asked, I asked Frank. I said, "Well, John and I, we'd kind of like to go to AA. How about taking us to AA?" And he says, "No way, because we was drinking. It was already drinking. It's eight o'clock in the morning." And uh, I've had people come up to me and tell me that's not right. Well, it may not be right, but that's exactly what happened. And and uh, I. He said, Frank says to me, he says, well, I'll tell you what you do, John. He says, you guys go and drink all you want the rest of the day. But tomorrow, don't drink, and I'll take you to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I always like to remember that last day, how much fun I had drinking. I sat over there in the keg bar by myself in the corner crying because I was alone and lonely. And every once in a while, one of you guys would come by and want to talk to me, and I'd want to fight you. And then you'd leave, and then I'd be crying because I was alone and lonely. And that's how most of that day went, all day long. And I, I finally, uh, you know, that next morning I woke up and and uh, I thought, my God, I got to do something about this stuff. It's just killing me. This drinking is just killing me. You know, it was one thing to have fights with my wife. It was another thing of what was going on inside. It's like everything I ever stood for, or wanted to stand for, every every respectful thing that I wanted to do in my life is getting chipped away a little piece at a time. I mean, I could not be trusted. My word was absolutely worthless. I had no integrity. I could not make a commitment. I had no responsibility. I mean, everything that I wanted to be, I was a zero. And I knew it. And I hated myself and I hated everybody around me. It's something, you know how it is. It's just, it's just that blackness and it gets darker and darker and darker. I mean, I've been trying to, I've been working on trying to commit suicide. I've been trying to drink myself to death, all kinds of things. And it's like nothing was working. And I, uh, I, uh, Went to that meeting that first night, and and uh, I almost sometimes feel like you almost need to make an apology. I've never had a drink since then. Now, some people, if they're new here tonight or today, you don't have to go back out there and drink again. You really don't. And I don't know why I was able to stay sober, and some people can't. I just have. I've just been able to stay sober. And uh, I think it's because I was more afraid of drinking than I was not drinking. I was given the great gift of desperation. And I was absolutely, I got to the place where I got terrified when I drank, because when I drink, anything can happen. And I mean anything can happen. And I got to that first meeting of AA that night. They, they, Frank had called up and says, come in a little bit early. He says, I want you to meet this guy, this guy Richard. He's a, he's my sponsor, and I'd like you to meet him. And, uh, you know, I knew about AA. I had the secret weapon. I knew about AA because what the deal was is you would take advantage of people who were down on their luck like me, and you'd... I'd, you'd start going to these meetings, and the next thing you know, you'd have to pay $25, $30, $40 a month, you know, and, and that's what the sponsor was for. You know, you had to pay him to take care of you, and, and uh, I, I just know these things. I mean, it just comes to me, and, and uh, I can remember uh, going in there, and geez, they were happy to see me. They was laughing and joking, and I was just shaking and rock, rocking and rolling. You know, I wasn't feeling good at all. They ordered a steak, and they wanted me to have one, and I, I didn't want it, but they ordered it anyway, and they ate it. And I uh, I just uh, I just sitting there, just I, I didn't know what to expect. I was scared to death because, you know, I can live okay if I can have a little drink every once in a while. But what happens to me is when I quit drinking, everything gets tighter and tighter and tighter and goofier and crazier, and my wife gets weirder, and the kids get stranger, and the people that I work with are just absolutely work at making me go nuts and and I have to have a drink every once in a while to keep all that calm down and and now we're talking about quitting drinking and I know you guys are talking about one day at a time but it sounded to me like forever I don't know if anybody else got that but this sounded to me it sounded like it was going to be a long time thing there was people in that group they were lying but they would tell me they had 15 20 25 30 35 years now, why would you do that to yourself? You know, <laughs> there was a guy at that first meeting. However, he was sitting right next to me, and I, I asked him, I says, "How long have you been here?" He says, "I've been here for two weeks," and he looked like he'd been there for two weeks. He was a nervous wreck, you know. But I thought, you know, by God, if he can do it for two weeks, I can do it for two weeks. It's an amazing deal what happens to us here sometimes. You know, we. The new guy seems to be able to talk to the new guy better than sometimes the old folks, it seems like. Um, it's an amazing deal. I I, uh, I was very fortunate to be with that guy that night. And, and uh, as far as I know, he's still sober. I sponsored his brother several years later. And uh, 
uh, you know, you get to AA, if you're like me, you get to AA, and you always, I'm always trying to figure the angles. I, I'm sure there's probably one or two people in here like that, but I'm always trying to figure the angles, you know, uh, what do these people really want, you know, because I can't believe that a group of people would freely give their time and their energy and their lives to other people just so they, get, they can get better. You know, it's, there's got to be more to it than that. It can't be that simple. You know, it's got, there's got to be, and so I'm, for the longest time, I'm holding back. I, I, I don't want to, you know, why would I rush into anything that might really help me? You know, so I, I'm holding back. I don't want to, I don't want to do what these folks are really talking about doing because it sounds like a lot of work to me. And that first night I, I was in this meeting and they said, you need a sponsor. And this guy named Johnny says, yeah, and I'm going to be your sponsor. And so he says, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to come home with me. So he took me to his house and he introduced me to his family and he introduced me to his wife. And they started talking to me about how great their life was in Alcoholics Anonymous. And now that he's been in so he's been sober for seven years and his life is really going good. And he talks to me until about 2 o'clock. Now, in Billings, Montana, at 2 o'clock, the bar is closed. And he says, well, it's 2 o'clock. Now it's time for you to go home. So I went home, and the next morning he calls me up and tells me to come in. He was an auctioneer. And he, so I came into town, and, and I was just, I mean, I was just absolutely rock and roll. Because I, I I'm not drank anything, and I need something to drink. And he sits there and talks to me for a couple of hours. And the next thing you know, two guys from AA show up, and they take me to lunch, and the next thing you know, two more guys from AA show up, and they take me to supper, and the next thing you know, two guys from AA show up, and they take me to the meeting, and after the meeting, Johnny says, it's time for you to go home with me now, so I go home with him until 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock comes, he says, it's time for you to go home, the next morning, I end up at his place, and then guys showed up again the next day doing the same thing, I was a nervous wreck, they fixed this concoction, k syrup, orange juice, a little bit of honey, some vitamins. I, I don't know what kind of vitamins. Put it in a blender. It says, drink this. It'll make you feel better. And I don't think it made me feel better, but almost immediately I got to acting better than I felt. And I would tell them, I felt, I feel fine. I don't want any more. I just, I just. <laughs> <clears throat> I, 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 I had about as much orange juice and syrup as I could stand, you know. <laughs> I hadn't had a piece of pie in years. And then, uh. I, uh, you know, I didn't feel better right away, but but something was changing though. There was there was something that I was getting out of those meetings that I was missing in my life, and it was a little thing called hope. And I, and I and I didn't really know whether or not this thing would work for me, but I felt like you guys were, for some reason, you guys were able to connect to me at a level that I had not been connected to in a long time, and I began to believe that you believe. And I begin to believe that you had an answer for at least yourselves, and maybe, maybe if I was lucky, I'd be able to do what you guys have done. And little by little, I started, I started to be better than I felt, and I started to, I started to get hope. I started to get that feeling that maybe, maybe something will happen to me. And within a short period of time, and I usually say about 40 days, I don't know how long it was, it was around 40 days, my sponsor Johnny started getting weird. And he would say things like, you better come over to my house because they're in the closet and they're about to get me. I mean, I was new, but I was not stupid. <laughs> he would say, you better get over here. They're outside in the cars and they're watching me. And, and <laughs> you know, I... Uh, I get phone calls from people that he was sponsoring. And they say, "Have you talked to Johnny tonight?" And I says, "Yeah." And they said, "He's a little twisted, ain't he?" I said, "Yeah." He said, and then Johnny would call right after that. Who you been talking to? Who you been talking to? And you know, and I, yeah, I talked to these, I talked to these old guys in the group and asked them what to do. And they said, "Just stay close. Just stay close." And within a few more days, Johnny went out and got drunk after seven years of sobriety. And he taught me a great lesson. He taught me that time was important, but it wasn't the answer. You know? And uh, this friend of mine, this Frank, had this sponsor named Richard. And Richard was a guy who ran around in a three-piece suit, smoked cigarettes like this all the time. And he was a little rigid and kind of nervous. And, and uh, uh, I knew that I needed to get a new sponsor. And I've been looking at this little blonde. I, I, she kind of had what I wanted, and I was willing to go there next to get it. And I remember walking across the room that night, 
Because that's kind of my first resentment. You know, I didn't get to pick my sponsor because Johnny told me he was going to be my sponsor, and I didn't get to pick, but this one I was going to pick. And I can remember Richard just kind of coming out in front of me and says, uh, sorry about your sponsor. I hear he's out drinking. I says, yeah. He says, well, I'm going to be your sponsor now. I said, well, Richard, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know if I really want you to be my, oh, he says, I didn't ask you if you wanted me to be your sponsor. I'm going to be your sponsor. He says, you need a sponsor and I need somebody to sponsor. He always knew what I needed. He was a used car salesman and in about two weeks he sold me a diesel car. You know? <laughs> Oh, there was all kinds of weird people in my, my home group. I, there's this little old gal named Millie. And Millie would sit there in her same little chair night after night after night. And it kind of gave me a sense of well-being just with her being there. She never said much. But if I sat next to her every once in a while when I was new, she'd say, geez, John, look at, look at all the miracles. <laughs> now, you know, I'm looking around. I ain't seen it. I don't. She says, you just keep coming back. She says, one of these days you'll be able to see the miracles because they're all around you. And there's this other old gal, her name was Margaret, Margaret, I don't even know why they bothered calling on Margaret, Margaret, you know, they'd ask Margaret to chair, and she'd say, my name is Margaret, and I'm an alcoholic, and them that stay sober, or them that go to meetings stay sober, and them that don't, don't, thank you very much. We call on Margaret six months from now, she said, my name is Margaret, and I'm an alcoholic, and them that go to meetings stay sober, them that don't, don't, thank you very much. It's like, jeez, come on, you know, I need a little more than that, you know. There's this guy named Gerald who was in our home group, and Gerald was a guy from down south, and he would, God, he, it was, it was terrible. If you, if they called on Gerald early in the meeting, you knew who was going to talk at the end. If they called on Gerald at the end of the meeting, you knew it was going to be a long meeting, you know. Gerald just goes on and on and on and on. And then there's a guy named Rotten Ralph. Now, Rotten Ralph was an attorney and earned the name. And he had, to, he had to sit there and he would hammer on, say, like some new guy who had been saying bad things about his wife. He would, uh, he would sit there and just hammer on him. And then after, the, after he got through, he'd always keep his dollar for his collection plate in his shirt pocket. And say, now, if I've really pissed you off, he says, let me be the first to buy you a drink. You know, I mean, that's no way to treat a new guy. I know. You know, and there's a guy named... Uh, there's a guy named Nick, and Nick's favorite deal was, if you've been in this group for less than six months, there's absolutely no need for me to learn your name whatsoever. You know, and, uh, oh, yeah, it's just a bunch of, you know, they talk about love and tolerance was their code, but you know it wasn't their code. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I was just having a hard time with, with Cindy because she was just so weird. And uh, I I was trying to, I was trying to get away from her, you know, and, and this sponsor of mine, this Richard, he says, now, how's your relationship with Cindy going? Well, I know that he'd been talking to Frank, and Frank had been talking to Cindy because they were old buddies, and, and so I knew I kind of had to tell him the truth, and I said, well, I'm getting a divorce. He says, now, let me get this straight. You're the one who's getting a divorce? And I says, yeah, I'm getting a divorce. I mean, she's crazy as a loon. Oh, yeah, he says, I'm sure she has anybody to stay with you for 13 years. has got to be plumb out of her mind. And he says, but he said, I'm going to tell you something. He says, you're not going to get a divorce. He says, we don't make any sudden changes for the first year. And he says, for you, a uh, divorce right now would be a sudden change. He says, besides that, he says, you don't know how to have a relationship, and we're going to work on that. We're going to, that's one of the things that we're going to work on is having a relationship. And, uh, oh, man, I tell you what, I didn't I didn't want to hear that because I, I really kind of wanted out of that deal because I didn't even like her a little bit. And I, uh, I, uh, I, I uh, just, you know, somehow I just listened to this guy. I just listened to this guy. I mean, like I told you, he sold me that dang car to begin with. And and, and I can remember, uh, you know, I, I thought, you know, I need a second opinion. So I, this Nick, uh, this Nick, after the meeting, you know, I thought, well, there's two things I want to happen here. First off, I want him to remember my name. And I want to tell him about how bad it is I've got at home with her, you know, and so I, in my best newcomer language, I don't know if you guys ever did this kind of stuff when you're trying to get an old guy to kind of suck into your deal. And I says, you know, Nick, you've got a few minutes. Could I, after the meeting, you know, there's eight, nine, ten people around. The meeting was over. He says, sure, John, sit down. And so I started talking to him a little bit and telling him about how bad my life was with her. And he jumps up out of this chair and says, so you're an alcoholic. 
What are you going to do about it? That's what I want to know. What are you going to do about it? And I was so embarrassed, you know, and I, I thought, that's it. I'm leaving. I'm done with the alcoholics and none of these guys don't understand. They're a ruthless bunch of drunks and I'm not going to fool with them anymore. And I can remember getting up and I was walking out the door and Nick was a little old guy and he's crippled up on top of that and he gets me up against this refrigerator and pushes me and says, now listen kid, you're wasting my time and their time and your time. He says, all you're trying to do is go out there and get drunk. So get after it. He says, get out there and get drunk. And over the top of his shoulder, out of no place, out, out of nowhere, comes riding off with this dollar. And yeah, let me buy you your first drink. Let me buy you your first drink. You know? Just absolutely just drove me crazy. I jumped in that, I jumped in that diesel car and I'm gonna spin gravel, you know? And I floorboarded that thing as hard as I could and just, mm, mm, mm. And I'm driving home, and I'm cussing, and I'm yelling, and I'm hollering. At the, I don't want you to think I was immature or nothing, but I just, just absolutely going crazy about this this group of mine, this crazy group of mine. You know, this, you know, a few days earlier, this this Gerald had stepped there, and he says, "How you doing, John?" And I told him, and he didn't want to know the, how I was doing. He wanted me to lie to him. He, you know, I told him that I hated God, hated A, hated her. And, he says, quit that. He says, I'm so sick and tired of that crap. He says, no, when I come up to you and I shake your hand and I ask you how you're doing, John, I want you to tell me that you're getting better in every way every day. Thank you very much, Gerald. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, you know, I got that going on. I got Ralph's deal. I got Nick's deal. And I got Richard trying to keep me with her. You know, I mean, this is, this is not, this is not what AA should be about. I mean, we're supposed to learn about how to quit drinking, not all this stuff. And uh, I can remember just driving that car and just, you know, just crazy, just absolutely crazy going home. And it's like something happened to me somewhere along the road. I had a long ways to go, and it's like all of a sudden, all I can hear is Nick's voice going, you're wasting their time, you're wasting my time, you're wasting, you know, so you're an alcoholic, what are you going to do about it? And it started to click on me. It's like, so I'm an alcoholic. What am I going to do about it? And that next, that, that night and the next day, it's like it started to come to me that, that I need to really take a serious look at what's going on in my life because of myself and by myself, I simply self-destruct. And I kind of knew this. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have to go back to those people. They seem to be the only people that I've ever been around. I mean, I've been around preachers and priests and treatment center people and, and, Franks and you name it, and those guys, they seem like, it seems like I'd always kind of tell them the truth, but not really the truth, but these guys seem to know what the game was, and they seem to understand the nature of the illness, and I can remember finally deciding somewhere that next day that I needed to go back to Alcoholics Anonymous. God, I hated to go back to Alcoholics get in that diesel car, drive back there, give Ralph back his damn dollar, you know, <laughs> 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 Reintroduce myself to Nick, uh, shake Gerald's hand, you know, how, oh, Gerald, I'm getting better every, in every way every day. Thank you very much. You know, I'll start listening to my sponsor about my relationship. But you know, something happened. It was like, for the first time in a long time, I was willing to listen to somebody else help me get better. Thank God I was that sick. If I had been a little bit more well, I probably never would have came back. But I was that sick. I was so sick, I was willing to listen to these people try to help me. And that's all they was trying to do. They was just trying to help me. A year later, this lady shows up that I had barely met just right when I first got there. And she says she wanted to see Nick, and Nick had died. He had cancer. And I didn't know he had cancer at the time. He talked to me that night. He had cancer. And she says, I, I want to thank Nick, and I want to thank Ralph. And I said, what for? She says, do you know what those two guys did to me one day? They just team tagged me, you know. Nick, Nick got me up against the wall and told me that I was wasting his time and their time and my time. And that doggone rock come at me with a damn dollar and says, why don't you just go get drunk? That's all you're trying to do. And she says, and by God, I showed them. I didn't get drunk, and now I'm here to take them. It's like, <sighs> them sons of guns, you know what I'm but that's how it, they, they seem to have this little dog and pony show that they pull off pretty well with people with secret weapons, I guess. And, and uh, what, amazing, what an amazing process. I, I was so fortunate to get, to get into a group who seemed to understand the nature of the illness 
who seem to understand that if you pat me, at least a guy like me on the back, it'll kill me because I'll con you. I'm, a, I'm just that kind of guy. And little by little, I started doing things that I really didn't believe in, and it, it would help. You know, I, this relationship that I had with Cindy, I mean, my, 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 <laughs> I mean, I, if you had a wife like mine, you would drink too. You've heard that? Well, you would. You know, I, I mean, I sat there and I could not believe these people trying to keep us together. It's like I didn't want any part of that. And, <clears throat> uh, old Richard says, Don, I'll tell you what I want you to do. He says, I want you to go home and I want you to tell your wife that you love her. And, you know, rigorous honest you program again, they got you lying. And I, I, <laughs> and I, and I can remember, uh, you know, it's like, I, I, I just don't think I want to do it. I, he says, I want you to tell her that you love her, and I want you to show her that you love her. Now, my, my ears started going up a little bit right there, but he says, not what you're thinking. He, <laughs> said, he, says, he says, what I want you to do is I want you to start cleaning up after yourself. He says, every once in a while, I want you to take the garbage out. I want you to clean up the kitchen. I want you to take her out to eat. He says, I want you to date her. I want you to treat her with kindness. And I told him, I said, I just don't believe I want to do that. And he says, I, he says, I don't really care whether or not you want to do it or not. I want you to do it. He says, but I'm going to give you a care. If you do it and you do it right, it will drive her crazy. <laughs> well, I believe I'll do it then, I said. <laughs> <laughs> so sure enough, I went out there and I started to do those things, and she she went nuts. I just, I just yes, <laughs> it was fantastic for a while because she. I, I was doing my inventory at the time, and and <clears throat> I went out there one day, and and uh, she was always she was one of these gals that it's like I couldn't understand why this was what was happening, but it's like. Up until I got to alcoholic, I was just a worthless damn drunk, and when are you going to do something about it? And as soon as I got into AA, it was like, well, you don't, you wasn't that bad. You don't, you don't need to go to those meetings. You wasn't as bad as those people. And it's like, I couldn't, I couldn't figure this out, you know? So one night I'm trying to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and she's going through this little deal that she did trying to keep me from walking out the door to go to an AA meeting. And I, uh, I told her, I says, uh, you know, listen, I, I, I gotta do this. I really do. And she kinda started, she didn't kinda, she started taking my inventory. She'd been working on it for quite some time, I guess. And she started taking my inventory about, I did this wrong and I did that wrong and I did this wrong. And I, and I would been working on mine, so I just pulled mine out and I said, well, you missed a few. And so I, <laughs> so I went down the list on these things that she missed and I can remember she just, she, you could just see it just, it just created, she just, you know, just walked off in the other room and I, I just, I ran and told Richard, just loved every part of that. And, and uh, you know, it's like little by little, in spite of ourselves, we started to get better, you know. And it's an amazing deal. I'd have, I'd have got rid of the wrong person. I, you know, when I was trying to commit suicide, I'd have killed the wrong guy, you know. And uh, I'd, have, I'd have got, I just would have made a tremendous mistake. Because i got to tell you, over the years now that we've been in AA and Al Anon, things have really gotten better. They really have. It's just been a blessing. And I, I love my wife. I love her a lot. And she's just absolutely phenomenal. She's been a great member of Al Anon. She's been a great mom and a great wife. And it's just been a blast. It's just been a blast. But I'd have missed it, see, because I know what I need. You know, and the trouble is with me, knowing what I need is not what I need. What I need is I need the stuff that you guys give me here. I, you know, one of the biggest things that you hear here over and over again is working with others. How in the world can I work with somebody else to make me feel better? It's like that just don't make no sense. But this society that we have here is upside down and backwards, it seems. And it seems like everything that you think you know, you don't know. You know, it seems like everything that you know that you have to have, you really don't need. But the things that you don't need, that you know you don't need, you really need. I need to develop a relationship with you. I don't know I need that. I need to develop a relationship with a power greater than myself. I don't know that I need that. I know that I need to begin to be able to believe in, in uh, this altruistic movement. And I don't know that I need that. I think I need more money, more power, more prestige, more tools. 
more barbecue sets. I, <laughs> like, geez, I've gone through a rash of that. I know everybody else in here is not like this. I only bought three in the last couple of months now. I, I don't even hardly cook. <laughs> That's a, it's an amazing deal what happens when, when you come here and you start to work those steps. Those steps seem to be designed for a guy just like me. You know, this, the doctor's opinion talks about how we have this allergy coupled with this mental obsession. You know, and, and I can remember when I first got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I really wanted to be careful. You really do. You want to be careful that you don't overcorrect and become an alcoholic if you're not an alcoholic, you know. And they talk about this allergy coupled with a mental obsession. And I can remember talking to Richard about this allergy that I, I'm allergic to apples, bananas, cherries, and avocados. You know, and, and uh, if I take a bite out of any of those, my chest swells shut, my eyes fall shut, and I can't breathe. And uh, they talk about this allergy happening. And when I take a drink of alcohol, and I told my sponsor, he says, oh, I, I don't want to have any kind of abnormal reaction. He, says, he told me, he says, yeah, you do. He says, you break out in spots like Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles. <laughs> and and I, oh, oh, I see. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an amazing deal, you know. But, you know, it's, it's not the same as those allergies that I have with those, like apples, say. You know, I, I to this day, well, if you're a new person in this room, you can tell me exactly what my doctor told me about what to do about apples, you know, yeah, just don't eat them, you know, it's, like, it's pretty deep, you know, that's one thing, <laughs> but now you think about that, that's kind of like AA, you know, I, I wanted AA to be really deep, you know, if AA was really deep, if your spirituality was really deep, I might not be able to get it, you know, it's like, how, why don't, don't eat apples, just don't eat apples, you know. And I've never had to, to this day, I've never had to go to AA, Apples Anonymous. I'm, it's not happened, <laughs> you know. I, I don't sit there on a, on a really wonderful day and decide, you know, I'm going to go down and I'm going to have an apple. I just, it's just I, you know, on a bad day, I don't go to the store and buy 12 apples, put two in the glove compartment, two in the trunk, and eat one on the way home, <laughs> and, and get, get to the house and eat one right in front of her just to show that I can. I, it just doesn't happen. It's not the same. To this day, I have never been in a real fancy restaurant and looked across there, and there's these people, and they're, they're ha there it is. They're, they're having fruit salad. Why, <laughs> why, Lord, why can't I have fruit salad? You know, waves of self-pity flow it. But that sure happens with wine. I mean, if you're an AA, I'm sure that's happened to you before. With wine, you sit there, and if you're like me, I'm, I'm watching those people, and I'm thinking about, geez, why can't I have some wine? And then it dawns on me. I hate wine. I always hated wine. Wine made me sick. My deal is two at a time and keep them coming, and it's not wine. It's whiskey and beer, you know, whiskey with a beer chaser. That's my drink, you know, and and it's like I got this imagination, this fantasy world that I live in, you know. It, it's the, it's that, it's like it describes in the book. It's that thought process prior to taking the first drink. It's that, it's that problem that's, that, that's centered in my mind. I don't have the same problem that I have with apples. I mean, there's no, there's no abnormal thinking about me having a good time eating apples. But it sure happens with booze, it seems like. It talks about that. Now, I love Jim's story in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, especially the part where it says, I vaguely sensed I wasn't being any too smart. Says, oh, yeah, Jim, that's good. That's good. You know, you got that down. Uh, but, you know, it's like, and then, then, then it goes on and says, and the experiment went so well, <laughs> I decided to have another. You know, boy, that sounds right. That sounds right. I'm with you. I'm with Jim on that one. You know, <clears throat> but it gives us those, it gives us those four examples in that book, in that chapter, and it says mostly that they failed to enlarge their spiritual house. Now, how do you, we're like boxers. We're like boxers. We all know that we're going to have to have a fight. It's going to happen. One of these days, out of the blue, one of us is going to get this thinking idea that, you know, I can have a drink. I was four years and two months sober. I had just completed one of the biggest deals that I'll probably ever complete in my life, and I was driving home from a town not too far away. And I was coming up on a bar that I drank at a lot. The bartender's name just happened to be John Scott. <laughs> You know, I used, now this is what I used to think was living. I used to jump in my helicopter and I'd fly over to John's place and I'd, Cindy would call him or I'd call him on the phone and 
he'd come out and he'd have a white towel over his arm and he'd have a tray with a six or a twelve pack of Coors Light with a fifth of black velvet whiskey. <laughs> now that's living. You know, I don't care how you call that's living and I'm going i I'm about four years and two months sober and I'm driving down the road, my life has absolutely changed. I've just made a great deal this day and I'm driving down the road and I'm listening to a Clancy tape and there's a thought that comes across my mind. You deserve a drink. And my other head says, yeah, you deserve a drink. And there was nothing that stood between me and that drink right then except the effort that I had put into trying to keep my spiritual house in order. I was very fortunate at the time because I was actively involved in my sobriety. I was sponsoring people. I had been to a meeting that night. I was actively in current with my sponsor. I was listening to a tape. The only thing that stood between me and a drink was if my spiritual house was in order. My other mind says, yeah, you deserve a drink. And I remember driving down the road, and I was going to see my old buddy John. And it's like something happened. I don't, you know, there's something happened. All of a sudden, it's like, I can't, this ain't right. This, this doesn't. And it was like, all of a sudden, my mind started to come back. And that's how subtle it is. And that's how quick it is. And it seems like we are all like that. We're all fighters. We're all going to have that fight, except we have to stay in shape. And the difference between us and a regular boxer is he knows what the date is. We don't know whether it's today, next week, three years from now. We don't have any idea. So that's why we that's. It's like this old lady said one time, she came to our meeting one night and said one thing that I'll never forget. She says, the reason that I come to meetings is because of my brain leaks. <laughs> That's good enough. You know, it doesn't have to be too deep for us. You know, if I get this thing to be in deep, I probably won't make it because, you know, I, just the way I am. I, I don't want, I don't want to, I, I don't want to make AA too deep. I think it is fairly simple. You go to meetings, you work with others, you pray. You try to keep current with the people around you. You try to stay involved. You try to pe treat other people like you'd want to be treated. You know, it's really pretty simple. You know, it doesn't have to be deep. You act as if and you will become. It's just simple things like that. That's why I love about Alcoholics Anonymous. But on the other hand, it's, it's everything I need to stay here. Provided that I just get me out of the way. That's all. It's a, it's an amazing process. It seems like I I uh, I've gotten everything that I ever wanted, and I didn't even know this is what I really wanted. I'm comfortable in my own skin. I can breathe in and out most of the time. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> Cindy. Cindy and I sometimes we fight like cats and dogs. You would swear you some days you could come over to our house at 8 o'clock in the morning and you'd swear that neither one of us had ever been to a meeting of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that it doesn't last because we can't afford it. That has a very high price tag. I can't afford to treat my wife poorly and she can't afford to treat me poorly. And it's just that simple. You know, it's just that simple. It's a uh, I, I was sober for about 10 years, and my uh, my sister had a store, and she was she was really depressed. I mean, she was she's not like us, you know. We can get you know, what kind of symptoms do you want? Okay, I can be depressed. No, it's not like that. <laughs> she was depressed, and she's sitting there, and she's going to, you know, she she wasn't, and somehow I ended up running this store of hers, and I called her up that morning and I asked her. I says, you know. Maggie, how would you like for me to take you out to, to lunch today? And she says, oh, I'd like that. And I was sponsoring this very wealthy man at the time, and he called me right after that and fired me as a sponsor. And he was really good because he was telling me why he was firing me. It was mostly because I was doing too much, <laughs> you know, and I was expecting him to follow me, I guess. And, and, uh, and yeah, you know, he was talking, and, and it was one of those conversations when you hang up the phone, it keeps going around and around in your head. And by the time lunch had came, I, I decided I went over to pick my sister up. This this had been rolling in my head a lot. And uh, I remember driving down the street. My sister hadn't smiled in who knows how long. And I remember telling her, you know, Maggie, I think really the truth of the matter is, is I've overcorrected going to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, this is only, what, 10, 11 years sober. I mean, you know, it's not like yesterday. And, and I'm going along there. And 
I, she looks at me funny. She says, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, Cindy and I was having some tough times there for a while, but, you know, we got over that. And the truth of the matter is I don't really think I drink that much. And now she starts laughing, you know. <laughs> And she just she gets down laughing. She says, "Pull into the gas station. I need to go. I need to go now." And she's just cracked up laughing. You know, I, I can't figure out what's wrong with her. So anyway, I pull in the gas station. She, she runs into the bathroom. And she comes back laughing still. I said, "What is so dang funny?" She says, "My God, you are sick, just like you've been telling us for the last ten years." I said, "What do you mean?" She says, "You don't remember? You don't remember how you drank?" You never drew a sober breath the last three years that before you went into AA. What are you talking about? You wasn't that bad. I thought, oh my God, my brain does leak. Maybe I, maybe I need to go to a meeting. You know? It's just that simple. It's just, you know, it's just that simple. So I keep going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I keep having the time of my life. And every once in a while, I get this little thought. You know, you wasn't really that bad. But just for the heck of it, I think I'll keep going. You know, because... I probably really was at that. I have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. It seems like my mind is on the side of the booze. It seems like my mind is on the side of the disease of alcoholism. It has everything it needs to kill me, and my mind's on its side. So I want to keep coming back. I want to keep doing the things that keep me in the center. And it keeps having me the time. I know I keep having the time of my life while I'm doing it. Now, why, why, wouldn't, you, why wouldn't we just stay here and keep doing that? And I guess the reason is really simple. We're alcoholics. We're alcoholics. Our problem is centered in our mind. And our mind works all the time trying to get us, you know, trying to get us to a place where we'll leave. So without help from a power greater than myself, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not able to stay spiritually fit. I'm not able to stay in shape for that fight that's coming. So I want to keep coming back and I want to keep doing the things that we have to do to stay sober. And in the meantime, I get to enjoy things like having a weekend with my kid, my kid, my grandkid, and my kid, <laughs> and and Tim, and and I get to see their her sponsor, and it's it's and I get to meet new friends. It's like what a gift, what a gift we have here. And if you're new and it hasn't happened for you yet, I just all I got to tell you is it's going to happen. It's not something. It's not like lightning that might hit you. Or it might not. You do what we do, it will happen for you. One of these days, if you're new, find some person to come in, and they'll be hurting, they'll be bleeding all over the floor, and you'll put your arm around them, and you'll tell them about what happened to you. And little by little, the lights are going to come on in their eyes. And you're going to experience an experience that we've all felt. You're going to feel that something in your life is really begin to be important. It says life will take on new meaning. And it will take on new meaning. And all of a sudden, your life has turned into something that you never dreamed it could be. And it's absolutely phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I thank you for asking me to come. I thank you for spending a few minutes with me this morning or this afternoon. And uh, God, I hope when I come back in a few more months or years or however long it is, I get to see all of you again. So thanks a bunch. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.